if you would please, find your way to 2 Kings chapter 5, please. Elijah's name is mentioned 29 times in the New Testament. Anybody want to anybody want to guess? Anyone want to guess? Thank you. Anyone want to guess how many times Elisha's name is mentioned? Who said one? You're right, Angie. It's mentioned once. By Jesus. In Luke 4, 27, Jesus said, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now, let me tell you why this was really, really a big deal. Jesus was actually, in, in, in the passage that he talked about Elisha, he was actually talking to his hometown. And he was showing them that God's people had frequently rejected the truth, had not accepted the message and the messengers that God sent them. And he used an example by saying Elisha healed or cleansed Naaman from his leprosy. And let me explain one of the reasons that was such a really, really big deal. In the law, there were very detailed instructions for what was supposed to be done if someone was cured or healed of leprosy. Does anyone want to guess how many people in the Old Testament were healed through a miracle of leprosy? Just 20? How many think it's more than that? 20 is not many in the whole Old Testament. It's less. Less. In fact, in the entire Old Testament, there is one person healed of leprosy, and it's Naaman. Now, let me tell you why that really comes into play in this story. The Jewish scholars talked about why there would be all these instructions in the law regarding leprosy when no one ever knew of a Jewish leper being healed. And they came to the conclusion that those instructions were there because when the Messiah came, he would cure people of leprosy. Because the only exception, the only time someone was healed of leprosy was the story we're reading about this morning. So this is really extraordinary because it's the only person in the entire Old Testament we know was healed. Oh, typo? Okay, well, it's too late now. Um, the only person in the Old Testament healed of leprosy was an Armin or Syrian. And by the way, if I go back and forth with, say, Syrian or Armin, it's the same country, just two different terms. Uh, you could, like, you could say someone is an American, or you could say they're a citizen of the United States. Exact same difference. An Armenian or a Syrian is the exact same thing. Now, in the eyes of Naaman's king, he was a great man because he was the general. He was in charge of the Syrian military. But to the Jews, he wasn't a good man at all. He was the conquering general. He was the one who headed up the raids into Israel. That God would heal a man who had conquered their country or conquered parts of their country was unthinkable. And in fact, the little girl that gets the whole story started was an Israelite girl who had been kidnapped from her home and was serving Naaman in his home. So on so many different levels, this is a story that the Jews were kind of conflicted about. Because obviously God did an incredible miracle. But it was who he did the miracle for that just didn't seem to make any sense. It was just such a weird twist that they had a hard time making sense of it. If you have found your way to 2 Kings chapter 5, let's pick up the story. And we're going to read verses 1 through 27. And here is what it says. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. 
At this time, Armenian raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among them, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He could heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send you a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, this man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent his, this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you'll be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Parfar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in, in a rage. And his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, Go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child's. And he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, All right, but please allow me to carry a... Please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. For now, from now on, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other god except the Lord. However, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master the king goes into the temple with the god Ramon to worship there and leans on my arm, may the Lord pardon me when I bow too. Go in peace, Elisha said. So Naaman started home again. But Gehazi... The servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to him, My master should not have let this Armin get away without accepting any of his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi took off, set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said, but my servant has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up, two, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. But when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. Then he went and hid the gifts inside the house. When he went into his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? I haven't been anywhere, he replied. But Elisha asked him, Don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servants? Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow. Would you pray with me? Lord God, open our hearts and minds to what you would say to us this morning. Help us to understand the truth of your message, the principles that you lay out for us that show us how to live. In your name we pray. Amen. I have several observations or principles that I, that I want to share with you this morning. And here's, here's the first one, and it's really, really obvious. 
We all miss what God's doing. Have you ever had God working around you and you just weren't aware of it till later? And then you could look back and say, oh, that makes sense. Well, that's what's going on here. This is a story that was difficult for the Jews because Naaman had achieved his high position at their expense. And what was worse is he had no idea that his victory actually came from Israel's God. So a servant girl in his house, who is never named, actually shares with her mistress that there's a prophet in Samaria who could cure Naaman. Naaman takes the message, goes to the king and says, hey, would you send me to Samaria? I want to be healed of my, of my leprosy. And he was a very val valued member of the king's military team. So he said, yes, that would be great. So he writes a letter and he sends it. What's interesting is that Naaman's hope came from a little girl who seemed to have no hope. And what made it even more remarkable is that Naaman assumed that his God must have been more powerful than Israel's God because he had conquered Israel. Little did he realize that Israel had been conquered because of their own ungodliness. That God eventually had said, enough, and I will let you be attacked by an even more ungodly nation because they're not my people. You're my people, and you should be doing the right thing, and you're not. Now, evidently, Naaman and his wife were very kind to this little girl because she sought to help him. She, she told them about the possible healing that he could get. She's talking about Elisha. Most likely, she had never actually met Elisha. She had simply heard of him. And apparently, she assumed he could heal leprosy, even though, as I said earlier, nobody in the Old Testament, aside from Naaman, was ever healed of leprosy. But this little girl believed there might be hope. And in a crazy twist of fate, God permitted Naaman to bring the little Jewish girl into his home who could bring him to faith in the God of the people he had conquered. This little girl appears to have had a good attitude because the wife listens to her and Naaman listens to her. She must have impressed them. And God uses her to save Naaman's life and bring him to faith. And she illustrates a wonderful truth that everybody can take heart from. Look at this next statement in your notes. You may think you are the least likely person God could use, but that will not keep God from using you. How many perfect people do we have here this morning? Not a single one of us. But aren't you grateful that God uses people who don't have their act together? He uses people like us. Most of you, I've been your pastor for a long time. And you love me in spite of me. Because I'm human, just like you are. Every one of us, we're a mess. But God can take people who don't have it all together and use them. In fact, that's what happens every single time. Because nobody has their act fully together. But God wants to use every single one of us now, when Naaman heard that somebody might be able to heal him, he goes to his king. It's just King Benadad at this time. He asks for permission to travel. His king sends him and an entourage, a great group of people. They carry 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, plus 10 changes of really fancy clothes. I mean, this is quite, quite the group. Now, I did a little research, looked up yesterday to find out how much silver was selling for per ounce, how much gold was selling for per ounce. Based on today's value, Naaman took with him $184,680 of silver and $2,920,560 of gold. In other words, about $3.1 million. How would you like for someone to show up at your house with $3 million? You'd pay your bills off as far as it would go, right? As far as it would go. The reality is, all this money, and it totally missed the point. Because God's man was not going to take money. He thought that if he sent lots of money, that he would convince the king to command the prophet, and the prophet would heal him, 
and that everything would be good again, when really that wasn't what was going on at all. The king's response to the money being offered, his king of Israel's request was, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? That's like somebody saying to you, you know, heal this, heal this man and I will give you $3 million. Now what would be the problem with that? Do we have the ability to heal someone? Now God might do that, as he does in this situation, but it certainly isn't going to be us. That's what was going on. God was working, but the people involved didn't see it. In fact, the only person who's really going to see it is Elisha, who sends a message and says, hey, there's a, there's a prophet of God in Israel. I want to make sure you know that. But it wasn't about the money at all. In fact, it wasn't about that in any way, shape, or form. So, one more principle that relates to this that is in your notes. God's at work in everyone's life, but we rarely see it. Every person you come in contact with, on some level, God is working. You may not see it. You may be totally unaware of what He's doing. But it doesn't mean He's not at work. He's working. You just don't see it. King Joram mistakenly assumes that King Benedad's actually trying to pick a fight. That's not what's going on at all. God's actually working to honor Himself. He has no idea of the deep personal pain that Naaman has experienced or the little girl's pure motives in sending her master to try to get help or the fact that God is actually working to bring Israel back to himself. But all those things are going on. The second part of the story, there's a transition, there's a shift. After he talks to the king, Naaman will actually go to Elisha's house. Let's... Look at the second principle in the story. Second principle, and this is a mistake. We all try to approach God our own way. Let me show you what I mean. When Joram hears that Elisha is, is that Elisha could hear the general, he gladly sends him to the prophet's house. The general's accustomed to the protocol of the palace. He expects when he pulls up to the Elisha's house, probably not a real big impressive place, he expects that Elisha's going to come out to him that he will say some magic words, that maybe he will sprinkle some magic dust, that he will do this, that, or the other thing, and that some grand thing will be done and he will be healed. None of that happens. Instead, Elisha sends a message through one of his servants, probably Gehazi, although the, the name of the messenger is not mentioned. He sends a message and says, you need to go to the Jordan River and dunk yourself seven times. Now let me tell you one of the interesting things about that. When I used to read the story, I assumed that the Jordan River was out in the edge of the yard. And he needed to walk across the yard and, and do that. But that's actually not the case. The Jordan River is about 30 miles away. And he's being told to go dunk himself in a river. And it was a river that he, didn't, he wasn't interested in dunking in. What is one of the nicknames for the Mississippi River? The Muddy Mississippi. The Jordan was the same way. It was muddy. Now Bible scholars have asked, why did Elisha treat this Syrian general in a way that was almost certain to offend him? We don't know for sure, to be honest, but I think it was because he wanted to deal with his pride. Even though he is there begging for his life, he has a distinct way he wants God to do it. And let me be really, really clear. God can do anything that he wants. He's powerful enough to. But God's not going to govern the world based on our opinions. It's not going to happen. And Naaman has in mind exactly how God's going to heal him. And when the prophet just sends out a servant to tell him, go dip yourself in the Jordan River 30 miles away, Naaman gets mad. His pride's been offended by Elisha's offhanded treatment. He's expecting a cleansing ceremony. And not only that, but he's been told to wash in a muddy river. Now, there are places around the world that people come to to bathe in springs. Uh, anybody ever been to Hot Springs, Arkansas? 
the, the hot springs down there. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool. People take baths in that mineral water. And there's places like that all over the world. How many of you have ever thought about feeling better by going and taking a bath in the Mississippi? Exactly. It's a polluted, nasty river. I mean, don't be wrong. It can be kind of pretty, but it's not known for its mineral characteristics or anything like that. But Elisha is actually trying to teach name an, an important lesson and here it is and it's a valid lesson for us as well we come to God on his terms not ours because God is God and we are not in this story Naaman is throwing a fit he says listen he, he, he didn't he just sent a servant out to talk to me he told me to go wash in that muddy river well we've got cleaner rivers back in Syria I could go back and wash in one of them But it wouldn't have done anything if he had. Because it wasn't about the water. It was about his faith. It was about his obedience. It was about him doing what God had told him to do. And ultimately, folks, it's always about faith for us as Christians. It's always about faith. It's about us trusting God, knowing that God knows better than we do. And we're not going to come to God our own way. Now, Naaman's servants come to him and they say, listen, look, think about it for just a second. If he had asked you to do something big and bold and important, would you have been willing to do it? And Naaman acknowledged, yes, I would have. I would have been willing to do that. And he says, when he says, let's go wash in a river, why don't you just go ahead and do that then? He said, wash and be clean and be cleansed, be healed. Why don't you just do it? So Naaman has second thoughts and he says, oh, okay. I'll do that. And so he goes to the river and he dips once. Do you think he looked at his skin when he came up the first time? I think he did. I can remember my dad preaching on this very passage and he talked about how Naaman dipped once and he came up and would look at his skin and it looked just the same as it had been before. And leprosy what is a disease that makes your skin crusty and white. And he did the second time and nothing changed. And the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And when he came up the sixth time, there was no change from what his skin had been the first five times before. But when he came up the seventh time, everything had changed. Everything was different. Did God ever heal anybody else in Scripture this way? Not that I know of. This is unique. It was God's department. But folks, here's the point in this second section of the message. We come to God, and God is the one in charge. We don't come to God and tell God how to do it. Frankly, that's my problem with some of these TV preachers today. They tell you if you serve God, you can tell God what you want and He is obligated to do it. That's not the way it works. God is God. As the, old, as the kids say, He's large and in charge. He's God. He knows what He's doing. God's the King. We're not. And Naaman had to learn when he came to God, we come to God on God's terms, not ours. There's a trend going on right now in the world that people want to be able to just be totally unique and care, and they want to be able to totally do things their own way. So now, now you're finding people who combine the parts of different belief systems that they like. So one famous Hollywood actress has, has decided that she's a Buddhist Baptist God on your terms, come to God on His. And that brings us to the next point. The third area that I want to focus on this morning. We all struggle to live godly lives. In fact, 
If you're here this morning and you don't struggle to figure out how to live godly, then I hate to say this, but you probably need to find another church. Because we're a church made up of regular people who don't have our act perfectly together. Now, in an instant, Naaman's life is transformed. He realizes that God is God and he's been missing out on the true God throughout his entire life. And like every other new believer, Naaman has a lot to learn. He's been saved and he's been healed by trusting in God's grace. And now he's going to grow in that grace and that faith. And he knows he's going to be returning home. But first, he wants to go back to Elisha's house. So again, remember, 30 miles back. This time, instead of Naaman coming to Elisha's house with haughty demands, this time, instead of Naaman coming to Elisha with haughty demands, he comes with a heart full of gratitude. Rather than expecting Elisha to come to him on his terms, he comes to Elisha with great respect. He stands before the prophet and testifies of his belief that God is the only true God. And the irony of that is at this point in Israel's history, most of the nation of Israel was no longer worshiping God as God alone. So think of the irony. This man who has been a pagan his entire life comes to God and acknowledges what most of God's people are not acknowledging. He has it right. Even though he's a man who has been a pagan in the true sense of the word his entire life. That was the highest purpose of Naaman's healing from God's point of view. Now, in an incredible change of attitude, Naaman asked if he can take back some of the soil to his home country. Now, let me tell you what's going on there. When he first came, he didn't want anything to do with anything in Israel. except He just wanted his healing. He didn't want to bathe in the Israelite river, the Jordan. He appears to come on his own terms, and he thinks he can because he brought a $3 million gift. Now, without paying for it, he has been healed. And so he comes back a very different man, and he says to Elisha, when I go back home, can I take some of your soil, all that I can load on the two mules, and I will take it back to my home country? Because the common perception in those days was that if you were going to worship God, the God of a particular area, you took some soil from the area where that God was worshipped back to your home country, and you'd spread it out on the ground, and you would build a little altar there on top of the soil from that country, and then that God could be worshipped in another place. Now, he has just acknowledged that God is the God of the whole world. But this, this mistaken idea still has, is a part of his thinking. So Naaman says, from this day forward, I'll only make sacrifices to the one true God. But as Naaman is thinking about how his life is going to change, because that's the reason he has this conversation that we're getting ready to study, he realizes that he's going to be expected to do some things that are going to create a conflict with his new faith. He's the number one military man in the kingdom he will be expected to accompany the king into that worship, into the temple of the god Ramon, which was the Baal version. It was the Syrian version of Baal, basically. And he said, my, my king is going to lean on my arm. In other words, part of my responsibility will be to go with him into my, to this, this temple to worship. And he said, I'm going to have to bow down, but I won't really be bowing down. I'm just doing it because I, I have to. But what's interesting to me is that he's having these thoughts before he ever leaves Israel. He's already thinking about how God is changing his life and how he wants to change him. The very fact that he's having this conversation shows he has been changed. He is not the same man that he was. Let me give you another principle, and this one is one we need to all consider. If you're committed to pleasing God, there will be times when others will neither appreciate nor approve. It's increasingly the case. If you commit to do the right thing, sometimes people are going to look at what you and I are doing and they're not going to understand. 
But let me reassure you, the goal is not everyone understanding. The goal is pleasing God. Naaman's request, Naaman requests Elisha's indulgence that when he has to go into this temple and he has to bow down, he says, will God forgive me? And it's interesting that, that Elisha is actually very accommodating. Even though one of the Ten Commandments is no graven images, no bowing before other gods. But Elisha doesn't make a major point of that. And, and guys, let me explain one of the things I think this teaches us. It's kind of the way it works for all of us. When you first become a Christian, did you know everything? You had some growing to do, did you not? Still do. But when you first become a Christian, you, you, you don't have it all together. You don't have it figured out. We still don't. But when you first become a Christian, you know even less. And God accepted Naaman where he was and was going to be changing him. He had already done a bunch of changes, and I think he was going to continue to change Naaman. But instead of creating a big deal over something that Naaman didn't know how to handle, he basically doesn't make a big deal of this because Naaman is saying, I'm going to truly be worshiping God, making the best of the situation. But what I appreciate about Naaman's question and response is the next statement in your notes. When we feel cultural pressure, we should do the same thing Naaman did. Seek wisdom from God. You know what would have been much easier to do? It would have been much easier for Naaman to never ask this question at all. To just go back and do what he had always been doing. But Naaman truly wants to please God. That's, that's the key here. He really wants to do what's right. And so as he's processing and working through this, he's figuring out, how do I please God? Folks, that, that, is really, that is really a wonderful example of how we know God had changed Naaman. You and I have to figure out, how do we successfully navigate life when culture doesn't always appreciate godly values? How do we do that? How do we draw people to God? Really, it's God that does it. But how do we work in that process? And Naaman is trying to figure all those things out. He really, truly wants to please God. God doesn't expect us to get it all at once, but he wants us to be growing. And it brings us to the tragic conclusion of the story. Naaman's life has been changed. He's become a very different person because of his encounter with God. But in contrast, Gehazi... The servant of Elisha, who has probably been serving God for most of his life, is about to commit a colossal blunder. He's about to sin in a really major way. Let's look at the final principle. Principle number four. We all give in to our sinful natures. You ever just been purely selfish? I shouldn't say pure. I guess that's not really pure. That's not a good thing. But we all have a tendency to pretty much think of ourselves sometimes, do we not? When I make statements like that, I always am kind of amazed. People look at me and nod as if, yes, it's all you, Tim. And, and I would have to say, yes, guilty as charged. But the reality is that's not what God wants from us. It is our nature and our tendency, but it's not what God desires. Gehazi becomes greedy of what Naaman has offered to give Elisha. I mean, let's be honest. Wouldn't all of us be a little tempted with $3 million? <clears throat> Terry worked this past Wednesday and actually had to miss our last elders meeting. Terry, if you had $3 million in the bank, would you have been working Wednesday? No, I would. I just suspected that. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. Gehazi gets focused on the wrong thing. He looks at Naaman and he thinks of Naaman as the enemy of God's people. And he says, in his heart, in his mind, why did Elisha let him off? This is the conqueror of our people. He heals him. And he doesn't take any money for him. He lets him get away with all $3 million. And so he comes up with a plan. And here's his plan. He says, 
Okay? I'm going to go catch him. And I will tell him the story. And here's, here's what he does. Look back at the story. He finds him and says, listen, hey, here's, here's what has happened. Verse 21, Gehazi sets off after Naaman. Naaman gets off his, out of his chariot. Verse 22, Gehazi said, My master sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived, and he would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing. You know what the problem with it was? Not a word of it was true. Not a word of it was true. Now, was it believable? Yeah, he didn't ask for much. He asked for 75 pounds. How much had Naaman brought with him? How much silver, remember? 750 pounds. A tenth. Yeah, just a little bit. And he asked for no gold. And he had brought 10 sets of clothes and he asked for... The problem is, it's still not true. It's not true at all. And Naaman is shown to be truly generous, and Elisha is shown to be uncompromising in his integrity. But Gehazi, the servant of the prophet, betrays his master and his trust in God. He not only tells a lie to get what he wants, but he lies about what the prophet had told him. He claims it's for God's ministry. And maybe it was. Some, some scholars think he was planning on using this to help the, help the sons of the prophets. Maybe. It also, been, it also may have been going to the fund Gehazi page. You know, the, the, the fundraising page. You know, the GoFundMe. Yeah, GoFund Gehazi. Gehazi. But here's the principle. If you want to know if what you're doing is right, here's a real easy test. Next statement in your notes. Selfishness rarely ever honors God. If what you're doing is purely selfish, probably not going to be the greatest thing. Now, is there anything wrong with us doing things we enjoy? No. There isn't. It's not wrong. But when something is motivated purely by selfishness and you don't have any other concern in it, it's rarely going to be something that honors God. It has, I thought, Elisha had been too lenient with Naaman. And so he focuses on the financial, not the spiritual leniency. He determines to get back some of the goods. In fact, let me tell you how he probably justified it. Naaman had become rich. He had become a big leader. What country had he attacked to achieve his wealth? Israel. So he is just taking back a little something that Naaman has already stolen from Israel. And you know what, folks? Here's the truth. If you want to be selfish, you can always find a reason that makes it sound good. Well, I'm just taking back what Naaman had already taken from us. I'm not really stealing from him. I'm just getting back what he shouldn't have ever taken to begin with. Now, when Elisha confronts Gehazi about what he's taken, it's interesting because look at verse 26. Gehazi hadn't taken olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle, male and female servants. All he took was, well, Naaman doubled it. He gave him 150 pounds of silver worth about $19,000. Still a lot of money. But he hadn't taken any of these things. Some Bible scholars think that he was actually, this is what he was planning on spending the money on, that he was planning on on buying the things that he lists, that he was planning on buying olive groves and vineyards and sheep and cattle, and he was planning on having male and female servants. He was planning on, he thought he had hit the lottery. The sin of Gehazi was deception and unbelief. The question Elisha asked revealed that the sin of Gehazi wasn't merely greed and theft. He was also envious of all the ways that God had blessed Naaman when he was poor. No doubt he probably planned to spend some of this on the prophets. Again, I can justify it because I'm going to do some good things with it. But let me be really clear. 
final statement in your notes. God loves us, but that does not mean he will un that he will overlook ungodly behavior. Just because you're God's kid doesn't mean you can ignore the rules. And then, and then it happens. Verse 27. Elisha says to Gehazi, because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy And with those words, I think Gehazi looked down at his hand, his arm, and the leprosy that Naaman had been healed from was on his, was, it was a skin disease. It was on his skin. A bad case of leprosy, if for Gehazi, represented God's judgment. As a servant of God, Gehazi had more privileges than most, but it also had more responsibility. Think about it. One man goes away healed because of his obedience, while the other man, indeed the one who should have known better, goes away with the disease because of his disobedience. The follower of God made a tragic mistake of choosing to pursue something of lesser value over the Lord. The tragedy of Gehazi's part in the story is that he was the one who knew about God, but he didn't live with that perspective. We have to guard against falling into the same trap. And actually, I, I saw a story this week that I that I want to share with you. And it's, it's a story that makes me sad. Gehazi is what we would call a hypocrite. He looked like he was godly, but he wasn't. How many of you were blessed with, by this story of the, the, the case for Christ? Remember we did that just a few months ago? I mean, an incredible story. The story of, of how God used the Willow Creek Church in Chicago to reach Lee Strobel, the newspaper reporter, remember? And how he, he researched and studied and came to Christ. And the church that his wife was going to, Willow Creek Community Church, is a church that God has used in, in truly extraordinary ways. They have reached as many as 20,000 people per week and have been for years and they've done more than that they actually started a network of churches called uh, I forget the exact name of it actually but but they have reached out to help other churches duplicate and reach reach unsaved unchurched people incredible ministry but in April the pastor remember the pastor who was preaching when when his wife when struggles wife went well, the pastor has stepped down because he was, he was he was apparently pressuring women into sex. Bill Heibels is someone I've appreciated his ministry for years, but you know, it's the very same principle we're talking about with Gehazi. Let me be really clear. Just because we're followers of God, we don't get to we don't get to break God's rules. It, it just doesn't work that way. God has used Willow Creek Community Church to bring literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people to faith in Christ. But just because God's used you doesn't mean you get to ignore the rules. In fact, God expects more of us who know more. So, I've talked to a few people over the years who have, who I can tell that they've got kind of this attitude that Hey, I'm God's child. I've been serving God, so I don't have to pay as much attention to me. I'm here to help other people come to God. Jesus made the exact opposite point. In fact, he used a, an analogy that really is quite remarkable. He said, how dare you look for the splinter in your brother's eye when you have a board sticking out of your own? That's the exact point. Gehazi was worried because Naaman was getting off too cheap. Because he had been a sinner. Meanwhile, Gehazi is got a, got a board sticking out of his eye. The point is, folks, we need to be what God wants us to be. 
because we're God's kids. I don't think God is going to say, okay, oh, well, you're, you're my kid. I, I can overlook that. That's not the way it works. And I'm not suggesting that anybody here is doing that very thing. But sometimes people who are close to God, who have been close to God, think that somehow God will overlook what they're doing because they are their leaders. And, and I want to be really clear. I'm not suggesting we believe everything we hear about everybody. This is probably, this is pretty well researched now. Heibel's just resigned in April, and apparently now the, the entire elder board of Willow Creek Community Church stepped down this week because they've been too supportive. They didn't take these women's accusations seriously. And so the replacement pastor and the entire elder board stepped down, which really means it's bad. But here's the point for us, okay? I'm not doing stuff like that, okay? I'm going to be really clear. I'm not doing that kind of stuff. But don't fall into the trap of thinking it's all about me telling you what to do and you telling others what to do while we ignore what God wants us to do. That's the point. Gehazi should have been focused on what God wanted him to do not what he could get out of his service for God. Coming to church, serving God, will help you have a better life. I truly believe that. It will help you be happier and more satisfied, but ultimately it's not about making you feel better. It's about serving the God who created the universe. It's about connecting with him. It's not about our feelings of satisfaction, or security inside, ultimately it's about connecting with the God who made us to have a relationship with Him. And if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Him, you need to invite Him into your heart this morning. And if you're one of His kids and you haven't been taking that seriously, you need to get more serious about it. That's really, that's really the gist of it. We need to be living a godly life because we serve a wonderful God. God, you know our hearts. You know exactly who we are. I pray that you would challenge and draw all of us to you. And God, I pray that we wouldn't merely tell other people what to do, but that we would be godly people ourselves, seeking to serve you and be faithful to you. Be who you want us to be. I pray that we would be godly people, not merely try to look like godly people. In your name I pray these things.